Okay, hi everyone and good afternoon and thanks for joining me uh, in this lecture. Uh, today, uh, I would like to talk about outdoor insulation systems. And in the lecture today, I will try to talk about the types of outdoor insulation systems and how we can improve their performance, especially against pollution. Uh, then I will talk about uh, what is the new trends in outdoor uh, insulators. Uh, and for next week, it will be a continuation of this, but I will talk about a specific topic, which is the applications of machine learning, deep learning, in the diagnostics of outdoor uh, insulators. Uh, I, I did some research in outdoor in transformers, but I will keep everything just related to outdoor insulators. Of course, whatever I mentioned it can be applicable to any insulation systems, but because for continuity and to make this lecture and the next lecture somehow uh, like one flow. So I will uh, just talk about uh, applications of machine learnings uh, next week for outdoor installators. And also next week, I will be doing some sort of demonstrations. I will be using some softwares uh, to uh, whatever I mentioned uh, or most of the results I will share with you. I will also basically uh, I will run uh, a machine learning uh, software to show you the uh, the results. Okay. So outdoor insulators, we see them in different application or different parts in the power system. So for example, uh, this is a 33 kilovolt distribution of our headlines. Uh, so these are ceramic, basically these are ceramic insulators, three phase system, of course. Uh, to the uh, to the right, you will see a 400 kV transmission overhead lines. Now, these overhead lines, uh, these these are in Dubai, uh, in the United Arab Emirates, and they have a story. Uh, the, the story is as follows: This overhead lines here is basically going through the city, and they want to have a design that minimize the right of way. The right of way is what is the distance to the right and to the left of the overhead lines that you are not allowed to have any construction, okay? So that is one of the compact designs that are available that you can actually narrow down the, uh, the right of way so that you can have to the right and to the left, not very, uh, I mean, the prohibited area is not that long. And these basically are using, the, they were using the polymer, polymer insulators. Here, this design is like a triangle, okay? And this triangle has a reason for that. This is to maintain that the, uh, the system uh, basically balanced. Because if you use different designs, then you have to use transposing every one third of the line to keep the system balanced. But this system here, when you have it as a triangle, equal triangle like this, so this is equal to this, equal to this, then you maintain the balance in the in the system. Also, outdoor insulation systems available in outdoor substations as well. Okay, this is an, uh, a 138 kilovolt uh, substation in Canada. And you can see here, for example, you can see the transformer here. Uh, you see the potential transformer, current transformers. And also, you see here the insulators. Uh, there are different strings here to hold the different components. So, this is uh, they are using here ceramic insulators, cap and pin insulators. Uh, as I said, this is to basically insulate different parts of the uh, substation. Here you see the bushings. Uh, the bushings as well is part of the insulation system. Uh, these are load break switches and between the high voltage and the grounded structure, you have also, you can see also some uh, insulators as, as well. Now, uh, Outdoor insulators they are extremely important. Most of the electrical power is transmitted and distributed over overhead lines. Uh, now, in some countries, for the distribution lines, they don't use basically uh, overhead lines. They use underground cables. But in Canada here, except you are in a heavy polluted, uh, populated area, like downtown, we use always overhead lines even in distribution. Of course, for transmission systems, we also use over headlines. Uh, underground cables for transmission are very rare, unless you really have to use them. 
like for example, transmitting the power between islands, for example, then you have to use an underground uh, cable. Uh, also here, the outdoor, so the outdoor sources play as the backbone for the overhead lines. Also, as we have seen here, the substations as well, uh, they are supported by uh, outdoor insulators as, as well. Now, those outdoor insulators, they have to withstand the stress, the electrical stress and the mechanical stress, both steady state and transient for switching and lightning events. And also they have to do this job under sometimes extremely polluted conditions, under high temperature, high humidity, accumulation of pollution. So they are basically working in a very harsh conditions. So that is why the selection of the outdoor insulator is extremely important. Now there are different types of the insulators. We can classify them based on the material as ceramic. When you say ceramic, you mean porcelain and toughened glass insulators or non-ceramic insulators. Sometimes we call them composite, sometimes we call them polymeric insulators. Also, you can classify them based on the voltage class as distribution or as transmission. So let's talk about each type of those insulators. Let's start about uh, porcelain insulators. Porcelain has been, we know porcelain more than 100 years. And they were being used before even the electricity. Uh, for kilogram uh, overhead lines. So they used like a, a post insulators, very small ones to hold the wires for the kilograms. And then after the invention of electricity, we will use them because they have experience, experience with them. So if you look here, basically this is uh, one cap and pin insulator. So we have here, this is the top part is called the cap, okay? And the bottom part is the pin. So this is why it's called cap and pin insulators. And here we have the ceramic shell. And the ceramic shell basically is attached to the cap and the pin using cement, Portland cement. So that is, if you zoom more here, so that cement basically one of the weak points of the uh, insulators. Why is that? Because those insulators, as we know, they are under extremely uh, temperature variations. Uh, so there will be contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion in the cement, which will lead to some basically sort of air gaps here, some cracks. And these cracks can initiate some partial discharge, which can eventually lead to the complete failure of these cab insulators. Uh, one of the research area I am interested in is to detect those damages in those uh, ceramic insulators. Why is that? Because we have millions of those insulators in the in the network, and many of them they already have exceeded their life expectations. But of course, we cannot just change all of them. So you want to only change the bad ones. So condition monitoring of outdoor insulators, especially the ceramic one, is one of a highly interested area. Now this is just one cap. Now we cascade them. We put them in series to maintain the voltage level that we want. Uh, however, there is no just one formula, meaning that if you need to have a voltage level of, let's say, 110 kilovolt, you use 9. If you use 220, you use 20, and so on and so forth. It depends on the pollution uh, of the area you are putting those insulators in. So the leakage distance or the number of strings doesn't only depend on the voltage level, but also will depend on the pollution level. Uh, the environment, how polluted is the area, then we select the, uh, the number of uh, strings uh, or the length of the string based on that. Uh, cabin pin is the main type of insulators used in North America. Also in substations, we use uh, post ceramic insulators. So uh, the difference between uh, post insulators and uh, cabin bin here, the, 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 the force, the mechanical force, here it is more tension, here it is more cantilever type. So this is why you will see that the core of the post insulators is much, much larger than the core of insulators that are subjected to only tension mechanical forces. Uh, now this is not cabin bin, this is the whole, it's one, one full structure 
uh, used for uh, ceramic, uh, all made as one complete uh, structure. I have some videos, maybe I will share them with you to show you more how they look like. We have a lot of them in the lab because our lab is very active, myself and my colleagues in outdoor insulators. Now, in Europe the, uh, and some other countries, they use long road insulator design. So this is like a long road. And instead of having cap and pin, it's just one full road. So that is one of the types of insulators used in Europe and it's a part of the Middle East as well. The second type is the glass insulators, but the glass and the porcelain both under ceramic insulators. Now, the glass insulator has a better mechanical strength than the porcelain. Uh, also, it, if there's any flaws, any defects, any damages, because it's, it's transparent, then uh, we can see those flaws. So this is another advantage of the, of the glass insulator. It has this advantage. Uh, one of the disadvantages, and this is not a joke, this is reality. If someone shoots at them, they are, the way they scatter very attractive. So it attracts shooters, especially in the, in the U.S. where guns are legal. It attracts them to basically to shoot on those uh, insulators. The th second type or the second class of insulators is called non-ceramic insulators. Now, porcelain and glass, these are the old technology. Now, the main motive to move from porcelain and glass to non-ceramic insulators was to reduce the weight because we will we are going to higher and higher voltage levels now they are approaching the one million volt and the the length of the ceramic insulators becomes uh, very heavy the weight of those insulators for a tower to uh, actually hold them and hence the design of the tower becomes very hectic very difficult and this is why we will start to thinking about different alternative technologies to support the mecha mechanically the insulator, the conductors, as well as electrically uh, insulate them. And here comes the idea of using a different uh, material, basically composite or non-ceramic or polymeric insulators. And this is started from the 70s, but there were some flaws in the early designs. We will start to develop more and more. And then came up the silicon rubber material and people discovered one important characteristic. We'll talk about it in details later on, which is the hydrophobicity of the silicon rubber, which will lead to a very good pollution performance of those insulators. So non-ceramic insulators are composed of uh, sheds or housing material. So this is the outside housing uh, material. And also they have the fiberglass core so basically you are molding the insulators on top of them okay so you have the fiberglass and then you inject the rubber uh, of the on on top of the road now there are two different ways how you can inject the rubber on top of the fiberglass core either you inject them as one mold so or, or one piece or basically you have the shade you install the shade one at a time uh, the full uh, injection mold insulators is more common nowadays in the, uh, for the, its integrity because there's not much of interface if you want to mount those sheds uh, separately. Now, the material we use it for the silicon rubber, it's uh, the two main material, EPDM and silicon. EPDM stands for ethylene, propylene, diene monomers, and silicon is a silicon. I will come to that silicon uh, uh, a little bit now ebdm has an advantage it's stronger the material uh, the aging of the material in the field is less uh, i mean it's less prone to aging compared to the silicon however silicon has the one of the best characteristics which is it can regain its properties as we mentioned about the hydrophobicity we we'll talk about that but after aging, the material loses this hydrophobicity, but it can regain it again. So that is one of the advantages of the of the uh, silicon material. This is this one is a tension type insulator. Uh, this is a this is basically a, a post insulator. The difference between the post and the tension again is the the uh, actually the cross sectional area uh, of the core. The core, because the core in both will take the mechanical load, the weather shed basically will cover the, uh, the, the, the 
the fiberglass core to protect it from the environmental conditions um, and also to provide the leakage distance. We'll talk about the leakage distance uh, after a few slides, but the main difference between the, uh, the tension type and the post type is the, the cross section area of the core. This is definitely because uh, the mechanical load here is more severe. Okay, uh, the 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 conductor will have like forces in that direction. So we have cantilever type of force, but here it is basically tension type of force. So for the tension type of force, you don't need to have a very uh, wide or a very large cross section area in the core as opposed to the to the post insulators. Now the silicon rubber material, as I said, this is one of the well known material used in the polaric material, and there are two main components of the silicon rubber. We have the paste polymer, and in the paste polymer, it is basically a polymer, so it's a chain that repeats itself. So we have the backbone is silicon, it's I-O, silicon, it's I-O2, that is the, the backbone, so it is inorganic. And that gives it more strength than organic material, it's less prone to carbonization, compared to the EBDM. And then we have the side grooves, the CH3. This is responsible for the hydrophobicity property uh, that we will see it uh, visually in the insulator. But basically, in a simple language, the hydrophobicity is the ability of the material to, uh, whenever it is, there is wetting, that the water droplet will be basically uh, not continuously wetting the surface, but there will be discrete uh, type of water droplets to prevent the formation of the of the leakage curve. So that is the paste polymer. We have also fillers. We have two main fillers, one called ATH or alumina trihydrate or silica. Okay. ATH is much more common in the in the industry. Most of the industry use ATH. And uh, there is one manufacturer I know of they use silica in the in the US for for the high voltage uh, for the silicon rubber material. Now, why we use fillers? There are different reasons for that. The first one is to improve the erosion resistance. Now, because uh, the insulators might be subjected to arcing to corona, you want to have the material the material to be strong enough to basically resist the erosion due to the uh, energy coming from the arcing on its uh, surface. So both silica and ATH will uh, provide good uh, erosion resistance. Now ATH has an advantage over silica. ATH is basically is alumina trihydrate. So it is alumina with attached to water molecules. So whenever there is arcing on the surface and uh, the temperature goes up, the ATH will start to be actually decomposed to alumina and water of, water of hydration. Now this water will be start to quench the arcing, reduce the surface temperature. And this is good because you don't want the temperature to go very high. Otherwise you will start to have uh, severe signs of, of aging. Another important of the fillers is to improve the mechanical properties compared to rubber without any fillers. The filled rubber basically has very strong uh, mechanical properties. Finally, to reduce the cost because the filler cost is much, much less than the cost of the paste polymer. So we add filler up to 60% by weight. We add them as uh, fillers, and that basically can improve significantly the uh, erosion and the mechanical properties. Now, if we compare the ceramic versus the non-ceramic insulators, we we'll see that both has advantages and disadvantages. Let's start with the ceramic insulators. The advantages, they have long history uh, of use, more than 100 years, okay? Now, you will see that most of the advantages in the ceramic are disadvantages in the non-ceramic and vice versa. So here we have long history of use here. Long-term behavior is relatively unknown. Now, this is unknown in certain areas. In certain countries, Still, we don't have the long history that we have for the ceramic insulators. So we don't know yet the long-term behavior. And I will share with you one case study, one case uh, happened in, in the Middle East. And I will show that the impact of 
not knowing the long-term uh, behavior of those insulators. So very stable material. So if there's arcing, remember this is glass or porcelain. So if there is an arc, arc will heat. The heat can be absorbed and cannot, unless it's really, really severe arcing, it, the material can resist. On the other hand, this is not, uh, this is the silicon rubber, for example. This is, so this is not a very stable material when, when this comes to aging. So it is susceptible to aging. On the other hand, the ceramic are heavyweight. The, the non-ceramic are lightweight. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned earlier, the main incentive of basically uh, using uh, silicon rubber uh, material is basically for to reduce the weight of the insulator so that they can be feasibly used for uh, low high uh, voltage uh, systems. Now, uh, poor contamination performance or hydrophilic behavior. Now, if the surface of the insulators is weighted, you will have a continuous path of water on its surface. What's wrong with that? If we have a continuous, one side is high voltage, the other side is basically ground, and if the surface is wet, completely wet, then you will have a leakage current leading to a flashover. So that's just something bad. On the other hand, the non-ceramic insulators, they are hydrophobic. Hydrophobic in, in, in a sense that basically uh, if the water comes or start to condense or to accumulate on the surface, you will not have a full wetting surface. Instead, you will have discrete water water uh, droplet. The last advantage is now this insulators basically uh, they are not I mean they are they are prone to damages, physical damages, either through transportation or installations, or people want to have some fun shooting at them or throwing some rocks at them and see them when they explode, which is uh, some people like that. Uh, on the other hand, the polymeric insulators, they are vandalism resistance because basically they are a fiberglass core and this is, it is basically enclosed with a silicon rubber material. So that silicon rubber material, basically it will absorb any mechanical force. So if you shoot at them, there is not much of uh, excitement there. As a matter of fact, uh, in one, one of the cases I was reading about in uh, one of the villages in Morocco, the reason they moved from glass insulators to uh, polymer insulators, not because of the pollution, but because kids like to throw stones at the insulators. So basically they wanna have something that does not appeal to others to, to throw rocks on them. So they change everything to polymeric insulators. So as you can see here, and this is the case always in any engineering solutions, there is no perfect solution. Each one has certain advantages and certain disadvantages. Now, which one is used worldwide? I, I just finished a study recently with one of the consultant and we, we have 17 utilities spread all over North America and we did some surveys and we asked them what insulators you, are, you, you guys are using. Everything is used, C ceramic and non-ceramic insulators. So, that doesn't mean that these are bad or this is good, but it depends on the environmental conditions. It depends on the, uh, the locations. It depends on the tower design. So there are many factors uh, will decide or dictate your sel uh, selection of ceramic or non-ceramic insulators. But what I wanna say is the following, all these technologies are still used in the, in the field. Okay, so what is the design criteria? I will talk only uh, okay, uh, Riza, you want to ask a question? Go ahead. Um, yes, so, um, actually, I saw in some countries that they use uh, porcelain insulators for uh, tension and uh, composite insulators for suspension. Do you know the exact reason? No, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware if the, the mechanical uh load will have an influence uh, it could be like some practices but what i know for sure that the pollution is the main criteria as we will see in the selection of the material ceramic versus non-ceramic insulators okay thanks 
So there are two different electrical uh, criteria that we select them. The first one is the dry arc area uh, distance, which is the distance in air, okay, uh, between the high voltage, this is the high voltage, and this is your, your ground. Same thing here, this is your high voltage, this is a post insulator, and this is the ground, okay? So what is the dry uh, arcing uh, distance? Now this arc happens uh, when, when uh, you, when you have impulse or basically even if you have high voltage, you might have a flash over coming into air. So this is called a dry arcing distance. And the word dry because here this happens when the surface is completely dry. Because if the surface is not dry, if it is polluted, then the leakage distance, which is the other criteria, will play a role in the flash over not basically the dry arcing area, which is this one. So here you see that the uh, leakage distance is the distance from the high voltage to the ground, but across or through the, those sheds. And this is why, why we have sheds, we will have corrugations. I want to increase the distance between the high voltage to the ground whenever there is a surface flash over coming through pollution. So as make this is deeper, longer, then I have a longer distance. And if I have a longer distance, as we know, the resistance basically is, in generally speaking, is proportional to uh, the material uh, resistivity, rho, times the length, divided by the cross-section area. So the L here, the, as I increase the length between the high voltage to the ground, I'm increasing the resistance. And for the best of my interest, I want to increase that that distance, but of course, cost plays a very important uh, role here in deciding. Okay, so what is a what is a good leakage distance or uh, for for the insulators? Some people they use based on history. Okay, we have in this country that is the the leakage distance we are working, and it is working successfully. So we keep doing this. So it is not based on any actual studies, it's some history uh, that people are using the same. Now, sometimes the environment changes. How come? For example, you start, let's say, a new factory, cement factory, chemical factories, beside an, over, an old overhead lines. So now you start to have a, a new factor to the equation, which is the pollution accumulation. So then you start to realize that, no, the the insulators that we used to have it working properly for 10 years ago, now it's not anymore because we have extra pollution. So this is why you need to evaluate the site, which is by measuring the most important quantity we measure to quantify the pollution, we call it the equivalent salt deposit density. And the ESDD, for short, basically what you do, it is you monitor the pollution, but the ESDD, it is the amount of soluble materials in the pollutant. So, for example, if you uh, collect it from uh, a dummy insulator, some how we, we can measure this, either by monitoring the pollution. So, basically, you have certain uh, devices to collect the pollutant, and then you take this pollutant and you dissolve it in deionized de water, and then you remove the non-soluble materials, you keep the conductive material or the conductive solution now, and you measure its conductivity, and then the IEEE and the IC standard convert that conductivity into this quantitative quantity, the equivalent salt deposit density. Uh, also, you can do that using dummy insulators. So sometimes people, they're having a substation and they have dummy insulators, mean that those insulators, they are not connected to actual overhead lines, but they are there to just have the pollution accumulate on them, and then you go and measure it from time to time. Or you remove from in surface actual insulators, and then basically you find uh, the ESDD. Now, based on the ESDD, there are different standards. One of them is the IEC standard. You select the proper leakage distance. So for example, here, uh, here the IEC uh, 60815, uh, and this is the equivalent salt deposit intensity. This is milligram. This is the amount of weight of the pollutant, the conductive pollutant per centimeter square. This is the surface area of the insulator. So how much milligram is there per the surface area of the insulators? 
So we have very light, light, medium, heavy, and very heavy. And then based on that, we decide the leakage distance, which is in inches per kilogram, sort of per, per kilovolt. So for every kilovolt, for example, 100 kilovolt, you multiply this with, with 100, and you get the, the distances in, in inches, and so on and so forth. And clearly, as you can see here, the leakage distance will increase as the pollution increases. And this is what I mentioned earlier, that to tell the total leakage distance, which is this one, this leakage distance, which is based, for example, in cab and bin insulators, how many cab and bin we are cascading, it's not only the voltage level, but more importantly, is based on the, the level of the, of the pollution. Now, most of my presentation now will be basically about how we can improve the performance of the insulators. And basically, we'll talk about the contamination performance because the consequences of the contamination that you will have polluted on the surface, and this is the nature of the outdoor insulators. And then, as this pollutant getting some sort of drizzle, light uh, rain, very light rain, or dew, then the pollutants start to dissolve and the conductive one, then you will have an electrolyte on the surface, which will trigger flash over, okay? And usually those who are monitoring this, you will, uh, you will find that the uh, flash over happens usually at the early morning. Why the early morning? Because at that time you will have the drizzle, you will have the dew, and you will not have a uh, heavy uh, rain. Now, if there is heavy rain, this is something good for the insulators, because you will wash off all the pollutants from the surface. Now, how to improve the, the insulators? Basically, there are five different ways of doing this, or the five different classes of approaches, or five different approaches. Under each approach, there are different ways of doing that specific approach. How to keep the leakage path clean, how to prevent water bridging, for example, how to in increase the leakage distance, keep the leakage path dry, and prevent water filming. So these are different ways of thinking. Depends on the environment. It depends on uh, where the uh, the insulators is is basically installed. So I selected some examples for each category, and I will discuss it uh, with you. So we'll start with keeping the leakage path. Clean because if the insulator is clean, then there is no issue at all. Why is that? Because high voltage in one side, ground in the other side, and the surface is clear, there is no leakage current on the surface, then everything runs happy. There is no, no issue at all. The problem comes when you have a pollutant, and pollutant alone is not enough to trigger a flash over. You have to have a pollutant and you have to have a humidity. These two together are important to trigger an electrolyte, which will trigger flash over and dry band arcing on the surface. So we need to wash the insulators. This is one you can do a water washing or dry cleaning of the insulators. Now, the water washing used to be done when the system is not energized. That is the old approach. So you have to shut down the overhead line. You have to send your crew and you have to do, do the washing. You can imagine the cost involved, the inconvenience involved in that decision. Uh, then we will move from uh, basically offline washing to online washing, okay? But online washing is very expensive. You have to use a deionized water, okay? Because now this is light. Now, if this water has any amount of salt, you know, the water that we drink from the tap water has significant amount of salt, depends which location you are you live in, but there is some good conductive. You cannot use that water. Okay, because if this is has even a little bit of conductivity, this is high voltage, you will have an arc from the insulators to the person who is basically washing the insulators. So you have to make sure, basically, that uh, your water is free from any conductive particles. Uh, some time ago, and you can search that, uh, live high voltage washing, uh, there was a crew in the UK, 
and you want to watch, I think it was 500 kilovolt or 400 kilovolt. And the guy was, he was saying that this is one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. And he said that if I have any doubt that there is a problem, even if I don't feel, I don't know what the problem, I just my feeling that there is something not wrong, I will cancel the trip because that's a mistake that you do it only once when, when you wash the uh, 500 kilovolt. If there is any problem uh, might in the system, then uh, the, a flash over coming from the insulators to the people is something inevitable. And this it will be very lethal. So it's very, very important to, uh, to pay attention to this. Now, how often we need to do the washing? Okay? Now, that is a, it's a $1 million question. Why is that? Because no one knows, honestly. It depends on the practice of the utility. Usually you either overwash or underwash. Overwash, you are washing too frequent, even before there is any danger, or you are underwash, you only wash, uh, you take much longer time than a flash over might happen before you, you're washing. Uh, people are trying to predict this, but still this is not an easy question to answer. Now, having said that some countries Basically, we need to do the washing. Uh, and remember, uh, the Eastern province in Saudi Arabia, they have to do that once every six weeks. We have one of the worst uh, areas in the world. And you can imagine these overhead lines, they extend hundreds of kilometers in Saudi in the desert. So you have to send the, your crew to do this washing every six weeks. So the cost is tremendous. And you have this is what forced people to think about some other solutions to uh, help them uh, solve this issue. Uh, dry cleaning is also another another way of doing this by uh, basically some materials, not water. Uh, they are uh, under pressure. You release this material. Uh, some of them have some fire hazard. Okay. But again, this is also very, very expensive uh, approach as well. So making the uh, leakage path clean. So you have water washing, dry cleaning, or use some designs different than others. If you look carefully to this design and this design, they are different. Here, this is called an aerodynamic design. The aerodynamic design, this is corrugated design. So here we are changing the this one to basically the aerodynamic. The aerodynamic has an advantages Especially if you are in the desert, uh, in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, I have seen that they use this design a lot. There's no corrugations because this aerodynamic will, will not allow too much of the pollution to uh, stay or to stick to the insulators. But those corrugations, now why those are used for some certain environments, uh, they are, uh, I mean, bad when you are in the desert so that deposits will start to accumulate here. Uh, beneath those shifts, but this is because of the aerodynamic profile that the water will not uh, stay on the surface of the of the insulator. Uh, the second type of uh, remedies is to prevent water, ice, or snow bridging. Now, what do we mean by bridging? Now, imagine this is the insulator basically here. This is the shades of the insulators, and if there is some water raining, now, if the rain bridge from this point to this, to this, then you will have like a complete bridging between the high voltage to the ground and you will have a flash over. I said uh, rain is sometimes good. Yeah, definitely it is good because it washed that pollutant. But like today we have in water low, very, very heavy rain. This heavy rain can actually cause some flash over events because of the water bridging on the surface. Okay, so how to avoid the water bridging, the snow bridging, uh, then use booster sheds. These are, you can see here, these are the ceramic, this is our ceramic post insulators, but you see this one, and these are some booster sheds. So you just connect them here to increase basically the, uh, the to prevent the water from bridging. Okay, now because if the water bridge like this, like this, then this one would prevent the water from full bridging on the surface of the of the insulators. Now this has been used originally to prevent flash over during the water washing. 
So when you do water washing, you insert them and then you remove them. Then people found that this is something that can be used actually to prevent flash over due to the to the uh, bridging. Alternate design. And this is also another idea of doing this or inclined shape design. Now, when you look here, this one, this is a post insulator. So you will see large shape, short, short, large, short, short, large. So basically, you want to increase the leakage distance. Now, but you don't want to use large, large, large because now the distance between this and this is relatively high. If you have everything with the same shed length, then the distance will be between this point and that point, then you will have easy bridging between the tips of the sheds. So to avoid this, you use alternate shed design. This one basically is schematic for an inclined. This is not inclined uh, because this is like uh, in, in a horizontal position. So if the water comes here, you don't need to have this inclined, but this inclined basically will facilitate the removal of the water from the, from the surface of the insulators. And this is inclined and alternate at the same time. So you have long, short, long, and so on and so forth. You could be have long, short, short, long, long, short, long, short. There are different designs and there is no standard for this and depends on the manufacturer mold basically. Because remember at the end of the day, this is a mold. So it depends what mold the insulators have, the company has. They will not have an infinite number of molds, of course. They will have certain number of molds based on the, their design, based on the need of the environment, sorry, the, the utility. Then you will, they will have these different designs. This is why when you look to the uh, shed designs of different outdoor insulators, you will see they are not the same. They are different in terms of even the color, different design in the sheds, and so on and so forth. The third approach is to increase the leakage path. The longer the insulator, the more you will have, uh, you will have more and more uh, longer insulators, then higher and higher resistance. Higher and higher resistance, this will prevent the flash over. So basically, we mentioned about the cap and pin. You add more cap and pin, as simple as that. But when you do that, when you increase the number of cab of pins, you have to make sure of the following. You have to make sure that the, the tower can still mechanically hold the insulators. Otherwise, you may, make, you may need to do some mechanical enforcement in the tower. Also, there is a clearance. What is a clearance? If this is the tower, and this is like the insulators like this, there's a minimum clearance between the high voltage to the ground, okay? So you have to maintain that, make sure that when you in increase the number of uh, cab and bin insulators, still you are, you are maintaining the minimum clearance between the high voltage to the, to the ground. Now for the polymer insulators, you need just to make them longer and longer. Now the difference between, and this is the advantage of the ceramic insulator in that regard, all you need to do is just add more disks, that's all. As I, as I mentioned, if in case your tower can resist uh, this extra mechanical load. But for the polymer insulators, no, you have to manufacture a different one with a longer leakage distance. So also here, taller post as well, okay? So you can have taller post to increase the leakage distance. But once you start to have a taller insulators, their cantilever strength will be reduced. Okay, then you have to make it with a, a larger cross-sectional area to maintain the, the same uh, cantilever uh, strength. Extended leakage current designs, this is called fog type, deep type. So you see here that you will have, this is the leakage uh, distance it goes all over the place like this. This is not the standard, this is called a fog type of insulator. So you are increasing the leakage distance with this. And this is easier to be done on porcelain or glass. It's very, it's not easy to make a complicated geometry for the polymeric insulators. Because remember, at the end of the day, you will have the mold. You will have the road, you will inject the mold, then you have to take the insulators outside the mold. So if you have too many corrugations of the sheds, then it will be, very difficult to take them outside the mold without damaging those insulators. So that puts some limitations in the use of 
uh, non ceramic insulators whenever you want to make some ex some uh, uh, more uh, complicated uh, profiles cleavage extender so this is basically you add, this is a ceramic insulator you add to it a cleavage extender which is with the red color here so if this is you look to it inside this is something like this it does do like this so you are in, so you just by adding it you are increasing the cleavage distance and also it's a protected area as well it's not sub because this is actually uh, if you look from here it is inside so it has a protection uh, and as well as increases the leakage uh, leakage uh, distance uh, this is an old technology uh, I, i'm not sure if it's still used nowadays which is resistive glaze insulator so basically you have on the surface uh, you you uh, the ceramic insulators you coat it uh, with a semiconductive glaze so whenever there is a sort of pollution happened okay uh, or even before that once because because of this semiconductive glaze there will be a very very small current on the surface now this small current if there is any condensation any water it will evaporate because of this high heat so this technology is good for short term but for long term the materials start getting damaged and sometimes you go for the thermal run away thermal run away means that the temperature start to increase without any limit and this can damage the the glaze this could be due to the damage in the glaze itself okay or due to the conductive contaminant that you start to have this also will lead to the uh, runaway which will lead to complete damage for the glaze uh, so as far as i know this technology used to be uh, popular sometimes you pick it but now it's not as popular as it used to be okay the last technologies which is preventing the water filming and this is the one that is now more and more used by people okay now an old way of doing this by greasing so this is a bushing so you, they used to, people used to use a hydrocarbon grease. So you just cover it with uh, with a grease, like a Vaseline, okay? So if there is some pollution or contaminant comes, it will be encapsulated by this uh, grease material, and hence it will not lead to any problem, okay? Now, the problem is the following, that as you have more and more and more of those pollution, polluted absorbed by the grease then at certain time you have to remove the grease and people found that the lifetime is not that much for the grease before you reapply it it's a couple of years max depends of course uh, is the uh, the uh, type of pollution the amount of pollution that you have so to reapply the material first you have to remove the grease and you can just imagine you grease something like this sticky removing this it's not a friendly it's a very expensive process and if we have to do it every time after a couple of years then that make it even worse and worse now the the recent technology we were using silicon greasing as as opposed to some hydrocarbon grease because this has a longer a relatively longer life but still, that's not basically the best solution. Now, here comes, now many utilities start to use this. They start to replace the insulators, the ceramic or the glass with polymer insulators. And some countries, uh, I know Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, many other countries all over the globe, they start to replace the ceramic insulators with polymer insulators. And you can see this is a very nice picture that shows the hydrophobicity of the insulators and see the water droplets here. They are discrete. Now, of course, this is for a fresh, uh, unaged insulator. Now, once start to age, this will start to change as well, and you'll start to have more and more uh, wetting on the on the surface. Now, as I said, there is silicon rubber and the, or the EPDM. But because of this property, silicon rubber is preferable than the EBDM. And under relatively clean environment, 
silicon rubber insulators has no issue and people are using it and there's no issue the issue comes with silicon rubber insulators under two different conditions the first when you start going higher in the voltages then you are going for instead of for example 400 kV 500 kV some utilities they have limitations they don't use silicon rubber material more than 200 kV and the reason is the following the cap and pin insulators, they are like uh, capacitors in series. So there is field grading here. But the polymer insulator is just one piece. The whole insulators are just one piece. It's like one capacitor. So there is no grading. And here we have very high electrical stress at the high voltage as well as at the ground. Okay. I have one video show, showing you this using some simulation modeling that these two, so you need to use a corona ring. And sometimes the corona ring is extremely expensive to be able to uh, try to reduce the stress from the, from the insulators. So many utilities, whenever there is a high voltage, they prefer to go back to basically the cab and pin insulators. Sometimes they go for coated insulators, which I will talk about it in the coming coming slides. The second issue, when you have a lot of pollution, when you have a lot of pollution uh, and you have uh, severe environmental conditions, these insulators uh, can lead to some catastrophic failures. And I will talk about it that once also as well. The second approach to prevent water filming is to apply RTV coating, which is stand for room temperature Vulcanized coating. What does this mean? Vulcanized, it's the process that when you have a liquid material, it transfers into a solid material. So basically, you have the RTV in liquid form. You spray that, as you can see here. And then after some time, it converts that spray, that liquid, it will change into an insulating material, a solid material. So this happens in the RTV at room temperature, at external environmental conditions. Now, the RTV has the same property as the silicon rubber. It is hydrophobic as well. Okay, So that will lead to a huge improvement in the, in, the, in the insulator. And what you see here is an application offline on a substation. This is a bushing. And you are basically applying the coating to the ceramic bushing. Now, the service life is claimed to be like around 15 years, but that 15 years is only on good uh, or less polluted, polluted, polluted areas. But it can, 10 years, many places in the world, we have reported that those insulators were applied for 10 years and no maintenance, no washing was needed at all. In some few cases, there is some exceptions. They age much faster. For example, I read in, uh, recently in Peru, you have some issues with, with the coating in some, some, some places in their country because of very, very severe uh, pollution as well there. But overall, that is one of the valuable solution for the substations. Uh, here we have live application of the coating as well. So you don't have to shut down the substation. You can also you keep the clearance here and you can apply uh, the coating when the system is energized to avoid. So this is a pushing actually of a transformer. So to avoid any uh, downtown, downtown time. Uh, so this is all for substation uh, actually uh, maintenance okay so here i don't need to do washing for the substation installators i don't need anything it's the same thing just coated and then for up to 10 maybe sometimes 15 years i don't need to worry about it it's very convenient and if you have to reapply the coating then you have to remove the previous one and you have to reapply it again it's a tedious process okay but it's worth it because it gives you peace of mind for 10 to 15 years. Then also we apply these people to some countries like in Qatar. I know that I will show you some study cases. People prefer to use what we call pre-coated 
uh, glass or porcelain inside them. So before you install them, you coat them with uh, silicone bro the RTV coating. So it comes from the manufacturer or you bring the glass from the manufacturer and then you coat them yourself and then you install them. So those are glass but coated. Now, why this approach? I will explain it to you. Why not use full ceramic, uh, non ceramic insulators or polymer insulators? There is a reason. But that's the big question. Which one we should use? Uh, should we use a polymer insulator, full polymer insulators, or we have to use RTV coating? Now, let's go back to the advantages of both and see which one maintain those advantages. We talked about the hydrophobicity. Both of them is hydrophobic. So that is a common advantage of both. Now, the uh, glass insulator or the ceramic, and here the, the guy is applying the polymer on top of the, these are, if you look here carefully, these are glass, these are coated, okay? Uh, the, here, if this damaged the property, then you, uh, of the hydrophobicity, then you have to replace the whole insulators. Here, what you need to do is to remove the old coating and reapply the coating. That's all you need to do. So this is looks an advantage for the uh, coated insulators. However, the weight of the insulators is very heavy because they are basically ceramic insulators. So you lose the advantage of the weight here. So the weight here and the reduction of the weight can up to 90% reduction in the weight. It's a huge reduction, which will lead to a low cost in the tower as well. So the tower that you don't need to have a strong tower to hold those insulators. So that is a big advantage of the of the insulators, uh, the, the, the polymeric insulators. Now let's come to the critical point. Why some countries decided to go with this solution, not that solution. Now the ceramic, the polymeric insulators, they age with time. Okay? And now this is like very mild aging. This is choking, this is crazing, this is erosion here, and then complete failure here. Now, if a complete failure happened in the insulator, the, the consequences for that are catastrophic. So this is a 400 kilovolt. This is 400 kilovolt in one of the Gulf countries. And if you look here, the insulators or the conductors fall on the ground. This is a four, a conduct, four bundle conductors. And here is the insulator. And there is a brittle fracture. The core, which is made from fiberglass material, has been fractured. Why fractured? Because basically the silicone rubber was eroded and this fiberglass was subjected to the environmental conditions. So in no time, there's some arcing on, the, on those insulators. They cannot handle the arcing. They cannot handle the environmental condition, which will lead to uh, mechanical failure. That's a nightmare. For a 400 kilovolt lines to fall down on the ground, that is basically a nightmare because this is a huge interruption to the power. And I remember when this happened, this happened in 2008. And they brought the manufacturer and they came up with some explanation and no serious actions was taken. And after that, I know for 2018, 2009, uh, 2000, uh, it, no, I think 2016 and 17, three or four insulators also is the same issue. And that will lead us to a big question mark about the polymeric insulators, which is their long term is not known. Or I may put it in a different way, their long term performance is not known at all environmental conditions. Maybe we know them, we have experience at certain environmental conditions, their performance is very satisfactory, but in certain extreme environmental conditions, they are not. And this is why here comes the, the, uh, the pre-coated insulators. The pre-coated insulators has this advantage. The pre-coated, because what will happen? What is the worst thing will happen if you lose the coating? Okay, there is ceramic insulators beneath it. So mechanically, the insulator is still, the integrity is there. But here, the integrity is not there. The insulators fall in the ground. So that is something uh, many people or many different different countries start to uh, basically consider the pre-coating. I will give you two examples. The first example in Qatar. 
Okay. So this is some statisticals about the overhead lines. So they have uh, basically uh, 400 and 200 and 132 kilovolt lines, and this is the link for each of those lines. Now, Qatar was one of the first countries to use recorded insulators in 1991. Kahrama is basically the name of their utility company called Kahrama, and they use the RTV pre-coated glass insulators. They first used it in 132 kilovolt, and then they found that the cost involved in the pollution removal, cleaning of is considerably re uh, reduced. Then they start to use this this technology at all voltage levels, okay? And the, this resulted in a reduction of the outages that, were, uh, that was only 0.2 outages per 100 kilometers compared to five outages every five 100 kilometers. You can see the difference, huge improvement in the, in the performance uh, in, those, in those insulators. So now this is, uh, we, I was involved in, in, a, in a research project with Kahrama and with uh, Qatar. And uh, this is the technology now they are using in all of their transmission systems. Now they have more than 40 years of experience. So they know the pros and the cons of the technology when to apply it. And, but overall, it is very, very satisfactory. Now, the cost here, the, the, if you just have polymer insulators, it will be less than to have pre-coated insulators. Uh, okay, but uh, as I said, in some countries and uh, the country that I showed to you that the insulators failed here is a country, not Qatar, it's a country beside Qatar, but we have both the same environmental or very similar environmental conditions. Another example uh, is in Italy as well. In Italy, actually, they use pre-coated insulators uh, in their uh, transmission systems that goes from 132 to 380 kilovolt. And as we know, Italy is a Mediterranean country. And uh, when you have your transmission line near the sea, you will have a lot of pollutant coming from the sea. And this pollutant is basically conductive because of the sea. So the, the drizzles and the things that comes out, the, the, the wind coming from the sea will start to deposit gradually, gradually, a certain amount of salt on the surface of the of the insulator. So they use this technology a lot, and they are again one of the successful countries in using uh, this uh, this technology. And uh, one other country I have seen also Peru is uh, now that utility there is called Turna. This is the name of the utility in in Italy. Uh, these are some statistics. How many? Insulators they have used pre coated from 2005 to 2011. I know some uh, engineers there working there in Italy, and I know that this is the technology used uh, uh, as we speak. The last two slides I have, uh, which is about what are the new trends in outdoor insulators? It's not just about improving the existing ones, we want to see what are the things that people are trying to improve the insulators in the, in the future. One of the promising technology is the nano felt silicon rubber material, both insulators and coating. Okay. So what is this nano felt? We mentioned that the silicon rubber basically is composed of two things, the rubber material and the filler, ATH or silica. Now the filler that I uh, that used by all manufacturers the size of the filler, let's say around five micrometer. This is the, the size of, of, the, of those fillers. We will now, and this is started maybe around a decade ago. So what if we use not micro size filler, but nano size? So let's say one nanometer. So what is the advantage of using this nano compared to the micro? It, in a very simple way, okay. Now, Imagine this is like, this is our like two pieces of the insulator. We are looking under the microscope. So this is micro. So these are the micro fillers there. Now the surface area between the insulators and uh, between the filler and the polymer is this. Let me change the color to, to show it to you in a better way. So this is the surface area. This is, this is your surface area. This is the interaction between 
your filler particles and the polymeric material. Now let's see what will happen if I use nano filler. What will happen to to this surface area? Will it increase or decrease? So here we'll have, instead of this, we'll have very, very small fillers. Very, 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 very small fillers. I mean, the, this, this could be many, many fillers here, which will represent one filler only, okay? Now, if you look to the surface area, the interaction between the, the filler and the polymer material, now this becomes all of everything around that those fillers will be a surface area so you are increasing tremendously the surface area between the fillers and the polymer and that has led to significant improvement in the electrical and the mechanical property of the material now this technology the nano film is not used only in outdoor but used in cables and some other and also even in silicon in uh, transformer oil, also they use nano-filled transformer oil. So this is a new technology that is used, it's still under research. Very, very little has been applied in the field. Uh, I am aware only of one case, and the result was very satisfactory. The only concern here still is the mixing become much harder. When you mix nano-filler, it's much harder, so more cost involved. The cost of nano filler is more than the micro filler. That is another cost involved as well. Uh, I, I was involved in a project that we are trying to use uh, recyclable materials uh, instead of using buying it. We found that we can recycle certain uh, material comes as a pie product of me, me, me making the photovoltaic cells. So this is a, this is another project uh, was involved with Qatar as well. So if we use that, it's like a sort of a green uh, material, and it shows that it has very good uh, properties for the for the instrumentor. Here it is. You can see this is under SEM. So this is one micro. So this is from here to just one micro. So this would be like nano. Shows you the interaction between ro the rubber and the fillers. This is as I said called SEM scanning electro microscopy. If you want to see something in details then basically you need to use this technology not just the optical microscope here this is another commercial material uh, this is coming from germany basically uh, you see here there are fibers here this is these are these fillers are circular these are the regular shape of this but here this made from fibers and and the, and also these fibers the uh, cross section area of it is very thin and we found that this these fibers has led to huge improvement in the erosion resistance of of the of the coating finally and this is what we'll be discussing next week in details condition monitoring is one of the very important areas and application of machine learning deep learning to classify the defects to uh, assess the engineers to do better uh, diagnostics of the insulators. This is uh, an extremely hot area, and there is a lot of research going in that in that direction. So with this, I will stop because, as I said, I will talk about next class, which will be all about this: how to use the sensors, how to select the sensors how to extract the information, how to apply the machine learning or the deep learning, all these things, I will cover them in details in next class.